All right, now we get down to it. The dedicated are left. So for those of you listening to the recording, it's about uh, 5.20, and uh, there's a very dedicated core group in the room with us here today. So hello, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Shosh. I'm a product manager at VMware. I'm part of the Software Defined Storage team. And uh, Dan asked me to come by to talk about um, storage, and specifically around vSAN and how it relates to OpenStack. Uh, you know, in the questions section, I'm more than happy to talk about general topics around vSphere and storage and such like that, but the talk today is mostly focused on vSAN. And the reason for that is because when we talk to uh, vSphere customers about implementing OpenStack, what they usually say is, um, you know, really love the stability of ESX, but the problem is, is the way I build ESX clusters today is designed for a workload that OpenStack usually is not supporting. So I have this use case where I have my OpenStack uh, environment that's supporting these newer apps that do their own replication, they have their own backup strategies, they don't need the high-end SAN services that are traditionally associated with a ESX cluster. Well, funny enough, we have a product that has all of the performance and all the stability that you expect from ESX, but doesn't have the back-end SAN services that you expect from a, from a VMAX or a VNX, and it's called vSAN, so magically, here we are today. And I would like to claim that we had this all planned out and we knew exactly the use cases we were building vSAN for, but I have to be honest, that wasn't the case. Uh, it just so happens that we have a, some, some technology that's come along at just the right time for a lot of reasons, and it just so happens that OpenStack has come along. And so we have a very nice confluence of events here. Um, uh, just let me set some context, though, before we dive into the internals of vSAN. And by the way, I will get into the internals of vSAN, and I'm happy to go super deep if that's what you want. Um, from a VMware perspective, though, this entire discussion is part of the greater software-defined storage conversation, right? We fundamentally believe that the storage industry is going through a transition towards software-defined storage. And um, like any one of these transitions, uh, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of discussion, and a lot of debate about these words. Um, I, I'm not really religious about this, I'm just, but I would like to explain to you when we use this word, what we mean, right? That is not to say other people's definition of this term is wrong, we're just saying we have to define it for ourselves so when we use this term we know what we're talking about. So when a, when a VMware person uses this phrase, we mean something extremely specific, right? What we mean is that the storage subsystem is broken down into three fundamental component parts. And they are fundamentally the data plane, which is not really a huge surprise, which has been around for a long time. And the data plane contains things like vSAN and vVol and SAN and NAS and all those wonderful things that we've had for a long time. But it also com contains a virtualized data services tier. And that's something that's a little bit newer. And in fact, can be controversial, right? So if you're not a storage geek, don't worry about that. What we're talking about is services that SANs traditionally have deployed. So things like backup, things like replication, things like compression, things like caching, right? If you buy um, a, uh, a NetApp FAS series controller or an EMC VMAX, they have those features right in the box. Nothing wrong with that. Awesome thing, it works great, scales up can be expensive, but it certainly does the job very, very well, as does our friends at IBM and Dell and Hitachi and, you know, very rich industry here, lots of support. On the other hand, what happens if you want to bring these services up into the software layer and have them aggregated across all your different storage implementations? How do you do that? Well, the answer is by virtualized data services. And again, there's a lot of people doing really great work here. Um, this could be a software-based replication tool. This could be a caching layer, right? So there's lots of interesting things going on here, but the difference is that the services are abstracted from the persistence, right? That is to say they can be combined in random combinations. And for those of you in the OpenStack world, this probably makes a lot of sense. Because in the OpenStack world, you don't really want to know what the storage backend is. All you want to know is, I want a cinder volume, and I want a cinder volume of this class. Does it sit on a fiber channel array? Does it sit on a direct attached disk? I don't know. And you know what? I don't care and I don't want to care. So that's a different way of looking at the world than traditional IT operations, especially enterprise class IT operations. 
And then, this is the part that, uh, that I manage, actually. So I'm the product manager for uh, the control plane, storage control plane at VMware. There is a virtualized control surface here. Similar to the virtualized data service, this control plane needs to be, surprise, abstracted, needs to be standard, needs to have policy constructs. Again, in an OpenStack context, this makes a ton of sense, right? When Cinder asks for a volume, it gives a very abstracted command, right? It says, I want a volume of this class attached to this VM of this size. That's all it says. So from a software-defined storage perspective at v VMware within the vSphere product group, this is a command we readily understand, right? We're very happy to, to honor the request. But traditionally, that's not the way vSphere used to work, right? And so this is kind of a new thing to enter traditional enterprise class shops, right? Which are much more used to asking for very specific things, like I want a VMDK on that data store. Might seem like a slight difference in statement, but it's actually a very fundamental operational change. What's a Sorry, what's a VMDK? Sorry. Uh, so a VMDK is a virtual disk. <laughs> okay, he was joking. <laughs> All right, you got me with that one, sir. OpenStack conference, don't use the term VMDK, sorry. All right, all right, so that's negative one point for Alex being a VMware bigot, okay. You're lucky I, I didn't say, uh, I wasn't start using, throwing Hyper-V terms at you. I spent 12 years at Microsoft, so it's very hard to unlearn the Microsoftisms. So today we're really gonna be focusing on, on vSAN, which is this little yellow box here. But I just wanted to make sure you understood this kind of broader context. So this is something that we're doing as an industry, as a company. The storage industry is moving this way. VMware is moving this way, our competitors are moving this way. It just so happens that the OpenStack community, we feel, can take huge advantage because the, the operational model and the workloads associated with OpenStack are pretty well suited to this type of storage and compute environment. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's, let's talk about the basics. Right? So at a very basic level, what are we talking about? Well, the interesting thing in the vSphere context is we've actually had storage abstraction for a long time in the product. We call it a data store, right? So if you're not a vSphere person, don't worry about it. A data store is just what we use to abstract traditionally LUNs, right? Or disks, or collections of disks. We always had this abstraction. It's been around for a long, long time. It was convenient for us to think about random blobs of storage as these things called data stores. We also use that exact same mechanism to abstract away implementation details like, oh, this one's sitting on Fiber Channel, and this one's sitting on NFS, and that's perfectly okay, and it's all a data store, and a data store is a data store is a data store. This is not a new thing in the vSphere world. Um, and then we also have this notion of a VMDK. Now you might think, well, a VMDK, a virtual disk object, that's not very revolutionary, Alex. Well, it's not today, but you know, when it originally was invented, that's a pretty cool thing. That the guest thinks he has a disk, a block object, but what he actually has is a file. And actually, if you dig inside of ESXi, the way it actually works is that thing that we kind of roughly refer to as a .vmdk file, because that's the original implementation, is actually not that anymore. It's actually a virtual disk construct that could be stored on an object store, or a file system, or a block device. Completely abstracted away from the guest. The guest has no idea that we're doing this. A disk is a disk is a disk, it just works, right? So this abstraction is not new, it's been around for a long, long time, but it's important to realize that there's this history of abstracting away implementation detail. So what we're really doing is just taking the next step and continuing to abstract away detail as we have been doing for some time. So within vSphere, there's another construct that we call SPBM, Storage Policy Based Management. This is not data plane abstraction like data stores and VMDKs, this is control plane abstraction. What we're saying is, when you ask for storage inside vSphere, tell me what class of storage you would like, right? So some people refer to this as like t-shirt sizing, right? Or gold, silver, bronze. Um, what we're saying is, tell me the kind of thing you want. I want a high performance disk that I'm gonna use for OLTP transactions, right? I want an encrypted disk that's gonna contain credit card data. Uh, you know, I live in Japan, and this VM may not leave J Japan. Whatever. The class of thing you want. That's what I care about. So within vSphere, not that the implementation detail necessarily matters to an OpenStack consumer, but between us friends, we'll talk about the implementation detail. The way we do that is through storage policy, SPBM. And this is not a new feature. It came out in vSphere 5. Um, but what's nice is that that abstraction mates up very cleanly 
with things like Cinder and Nova. Because Cinder and Nova don't want to know what a data store is. They don't know, want to know what a LUN is. They don't really want to care about the difference between a uh, high performance, fast enabled fiber channel LUN on a VMAX and a really, really slow uh, ZFS based NAS that I built myself out of component parts and it's lucky if it can do 10 IOPS an hour, right? Those things shouldn't matter to OpenStack. And the way we make it not matter in our implementation is this thing called SPBM. And I love SPBM because I'm the PM for SPBM. Anyway, everybody has a mommy and a daddy. And yeah. So anyway, um, so we're, the other interesting thing that's going on inside of vSphere and VMware is that we're moving away from, from LUNs. Um, one of the big trends you're seeing inside of our product line is that we're attempting to move towards VM granular management of all things. And again, this might seem like a trivial change, but actually if you get into the guts of the way the thing works, it's a pretty big deal. Traditionally, what we would do, is, if you look at most enterprise customers today who are deploying vSphere, what they do is they take um, LUNs, usually large ones, you know, two terabytes or so or larger, and then they pre-allocate into the cluster a, a group of LUNs, a group of data stores, and then they consume against those LUNs until the LUNs are full. And then they just start over again, right? That's a pretty normal implementation model in a vSphere customer, which is cool if you only want to do one thing, right? But what happens if I have some VMs that need encryption and some VMs that need replication and some need high performance and some don't, some are expensive and some not? See where I'm going here, right? Being able to carve up those LUNs into multiple classes of service and to provide additional data services like replication and backup becomes very complicated. So now these really big buckets that you're trying to carve up into little teeny boxes. That's actually pretty hard. Try to take a bucket of water, right? And it, you can't do it. So instead what we're doing is we're moving away from that model. We're moving towards a VM granular management model. So in a, in a vSAN or a vVol use case, and vSAN and vVol are both features that are, that are relatively new. vSAN shipped this year, vVol is gonna ship next year. What you do is when you ask for storage from us, you don't get a LUN. Right? What you get is a virtual disk object. And it's actually just that. It's an object-based file system. Uh, sorry, object-based storage system. Both vVol and vSAN are both object-based. So you say, okay, I want this virtual disk, and here are the properties I want it to have. This is starting to sound familiar, I hope, because that's exactly the way Cinder works. So now what's happening is, is that our plumbing looks a lot more like the cloud operating model that people like OpenStack are asking for. Now this is not unique to OpenStack, by the way, right? This is exactly what people like Cloudio wants, and this is what our product called vCake, uh, vCloud Automation Center, they want that. So, you know, from a, from a plumbing perspective, as the hypervisor, we, ha we, you know, we have to serve multiple masters, but for the context of this room, we're, we're talking about things like Nova and Cinder requesting virtual disks. So when, when we wrote a Cinder driver last year, we made sure that that Cinder driver was based on these virtual disk objects, these VMDKs. So when you get a VMDK object, uh, when you get an object from Cinder using our driver, you don't get what we, call, we refer to as an RDM, right, or a raw device map. You actually get a virtual disk. And the reason why we do that is because that future proofs you against technologies like vSAN and vVol, which don't support raw disks. So that's the reason why we did that. So what's the workflow? What does it look like? Hopefully this is pretty simple and obvious to you guys, but I'll just cover it real quick. Um, so the first thing you need to do is you need to set up your capacity pools. Um, that, in the Havana release, that meant you had to make the data stores available. In the Icehouse release, what that means is that you're gonna use SPBM to discover your storage tiers, basically. Um, then your cloud admin, your, your OpenStack admin, creates their um, Cinder volumes, the volume types, excuse me, excuse me. The reason why we do this is because it's actually the volume type that allows us to inject metadata into the ask, into the request, through the extra specs mechanism. I have a little demo of this later so I can show you how this works. Um, and then when the consumer creates a volume, they select the send volume type, because that's tied to the metadata injection, right, in the extra spec, we see the request coming down saying, okay, I want an object of this class. We use the storage policy-based management infrastructure to select a container to put it in. We can set properties against it if we have to at the same time. We provision the object and then present it to the VM. 
The only kind of weird thing about implementation, and Dan mentioned this earlier in his presentation, but that was like two and a half hours ago, so you may not remember. But what we do is we actually lazy create the virtual disk. We do not create it when you create the Cinder object. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One is because you could provision a thousand Cinder volumes and never use them. So why should I have space on my back end that you don't need? The other reason is when we know where you're going to put the Cinder volume, then we know what data stores the, the, the um, VM can see. So why create it on data store X and then immediately SV motion it, storage V motion it to data store Y? That doesn't make any sense. So we know, oh, I'm going to attach it to this VM and this VM can see these 10 data stores. Maybe I should make it on one of those 10 data stores, right? Instead of making it over here and moving it. So that's the re one of the other reasons why we lazy create. Performance is better and it helps us decide where to put it. After it's created, if I detach the volume and then present it to another VM that's running on another cluster that can't see the local storage, then we silently move it to a data store that the VM can see. And the vSphere feature we're using is called SV Motion. Doesn't really matter what we call the feature, we just silently move it in the background. So it looks like you just attach it and reattach, but actually what happens is we detach, move, and then reattach. And then it all happens in the background. The question is, is that only relevant for vSAN? No, that's for any, any data store, any class of data store, NFS, Fiber Channel, iSCSI, it doesn't matter. Not all data stores are visible to all clusters, right? So there may be a case where I need to do a SV motion um, because VM1 is on a different cluster than VM2. Lots of reasons why I might have to do that. So the code just does that generically in the background. Um, so the question is, I thought vSAN was going to make them available to all. The, the answer is that vSAN is available to all members of a single cluster. So if you're within a cluster, you're good. If you're moving cross clusters, then you'll still have to ask vMotion. Okay. The other weird thing about our implementation on Cinder, just to give you a kind of like the nitty gritty, is because of the way vSphere works, we don't actually manage disks like Cinder does. Like Cinder knows what a disk is, because that's all it does. It assigns the disk a GUID, and then it detaches the disk, and then sometime later it comes back and says, you remember that disk I made like two years ago? Yeah, I want it back now. Uh, vSphere doesn't work that way. vSphere manages VMs. Disks are children of VMs. So when you detach a disk from a VM, we can kind of forget about it. It, it may still be there, but we don't really know that it's there. So what we do is we cheat, and, and I'll fully admit that this is a hack, but we make it work, is we create a fake VM, right? A metadata-only object. And we make the Cinder volume a child of that shadow VM. And the only reason why we do that is so that we don't lose track of the disk ever. So if you detach the disk and then come back a year from now and ask it for it back, we can find it. And the reason is because the name of that fake VM is the GUID of the Cinder object. So we can always find it. So it's just a little bit of a hack to get around the way vSphere works. Um, this will be fixed in a future version of vSphere. But today, we have to hack it around. Um, it turns out that making a VM is a relatively cheap operation, so it's not a huge deal. We hide them in a special folder so they're not cluttering up your main stuff, but just want to let you know, if you see weird things in your vSphere UI, that's what it is, and that's why it's there. If you delete that VM by hand, we lose our minds, right? So please don't do that. So how does vSAN fit into all this, Alex? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, it turns out that uh, vSAN because it is inherently uh, local storage, has a couple of interesting things in the OpenStack world. One is it's directly connected to the hypervisor. So when you scale the hypervisor, you scale the storage. And one of the things about cloud, as we all know, is that cloud is all about the perception of infiniteness, right? In a cloud world, we think the world's infinite. We pretend like it's infinite. Uh, it's not, but we pretend like it is. And the way we achieve the appearance of infinity is we simply are able to scale very quickly and be very flexible. Well, what's one thing we know for certain about traditional SAN architectures? They don't magically appear, right? Somebody has to install them, somebody has to set them up. Usually in most corporate environments, that's two separate teams. Right? So you have to plan ahead. So usually what people do is they buy SANA capacity in advance. They pre-provision. That can get a little expensive. So in this case, by bringing the storage into the cluster, 
What's happening is every time you add a node to a cluster or every time you add a cluster, you're automatically adding storage capacity because compute and storage are now one thing. So that, to some extent, solves that scaling and planning problem. I'm also adding storage in much, much smaller increments. Right? Most storage arrays, now I'm talking about traditional storage arrays, not, not some of the new guys that are doing these um, uh, scale out scenario, but traditionally, you know, storage would have a, a head unit, right, or probably a pair of head units, and then you'd scale out with shelves. Right? If you think about it, every time you bring a new head unit on, that's a pretty significant scale factor. Right, because you just brought a lot of IOPS capacity, and then you start consuming against that as you had the shelves. More modern storage architectures don't work that way. Right, they operate in a peer mode and they scale out linearly. vSAN is like that. So vSAN adds capacity with every single uh, member of the cluster added. It doesn't necessarily have this big scale factor. You don't add 100,000 IOPS in one chunk. Right, you're adding them in much smaller chunks. Um, so uh, we. Um, are supporting this today um, in uh, Cinder as a vice house, and we're, ad and we're adding support for um, Nova and uh, um, in Glance. Um, actually, the code is already there. We've already published it on the community, and we're just working with the reviewers to get it upstreamed. So the interesting thing about vSAN is that vSAN was designed as a hybrid storage system from the get-go, um, and again, for the non-storage people out there, hybrid is kind of storage speak for both flash and rotating media. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the Blues Brothers joke, right? What kind of music do you have here? Well, we have both kinds, country and western. So the question is, what kind of disks do uh, vSAN users support? Both kinds, flash and rotating. So the vSAN node is always both a flash disk and a rotating media. Always. And in fact, the minimum configuration for vSAN is three physical hosts, and each one of those hosts must have two spindles, one flash, one rotating. And once I get into the architectural slide, you'll understand why that's the case. So the absolute minimum number of disks that you can use to build your own personal system is six, right? Two each and three hosts. The reason why we need three hosts is because we have to have a witness. We scale up to 32 nodes, but we scale down only to three. That's the minimum. Uh, we don't use traditional rate, right? We use an array of nodes. So when we do failover and we do uh, 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 availability metrics, we always do it based on node, complete node failure. So we're not striping. We're not using rate five. We're not using rate six, right? We take the object. We replicate the object n times, depending on the settings of the object. The interesting thing here is that replication setting, that availability setting, that's actually a property of the virtual disk, not the entire data store. So that's the other interesting thing about traditional storage arrays, is if I wanted to have a high availability LUN, right, I'd probably have to set that availability down in the RAID group, right, shelf level. And then I start putting things in there because it happens to have that RAID level. In vSAN, that's not the way it works. Every time I provision an object, every time I make that decision, do I want N availability, N plus one, N plus two, N plus three? So you could have two VMs, one is hugely important, and one is completely unimportant, sitting on exactly the same data store at the same time, running at completely different service levels. vSAN doesn't care, right? That's just built into the way vSAN works. And how do I get that different level of, of execution? Through storage policy, right? As I already said, you set the policy, apply the policy to the object, and that's how we decide, do I replicate this thing how much flash do I reserve? How many stripes do I make? So um, for those of you that are familiar with the VMware uh, kind of not language, um, we have these things called VSA, virtual storage appliances. Very important to note, not a VSA. vSAN is in the kernel. This is an ESXi feature. This is a kernel level storage fe feature. Extremely high performance, high scale, enterprise grade storage. So don't be confused about that. If you don't know what a VSA is, don't worry about it. But for those of you that are more VMware, vSphere knowledgeable, we want to make sure we're really clear about that. So there's really three seemingly conflicting goals, right? We wanted to make something that was hugely simple. We wanted to make something that was very high performance. And we wanted to make something that had very low TCL. What's interesting is if you look out in the marketplace, it's a kind of a, right now it's kind of a pick two scenario. 
right? You can have any one of these two. We wanted to have all three at once. And to do that, we had to invent a completely new way of doing storage. So that's why uh, the architecture is so different. So I, I mentioned this before, so I'll go real quick through this slide. But what we're saying is, is that the VMs themselves have individual storage policy, and those policies control the way vSAN works. Those policies can concern things like availability, striping, performance, IOPS, use of flash. All those things are all controlled through policy. That policy is assigned to the object. When the object is created, and when I say object, I mean in this case a virtual disk. When the object is created, that information is handed to vSAN, and then vSAN takes appropriate action. Note there's no LUNs here. No, no LUNs at all. vSAN is an object store. Extremely specialized object store that really only stores two things. It stores VM metadata and virtual disks. That's it. Now in theory, we could have implemented a, a generic object store, but instead we chose to implement a very, very, very focused object store. And the reason why we did is for performance, right? We're highly optimized to a small number of extremely large objects, right? Because we wanted to make sure that we had the enterprise grade performance. And we were pretty successful. The scale limits of uh, vSAN are quite high. So you can have a 32 hosts in a single vSAN cluster. Why 32, Alex? Because that's the limit for ESX. We scale to ESX's limits. That's the point. It's an ESX feature. It's not a separate thing. 3,200 VMs in one cluster. 2 million IOPS. 2 million IOPS. 4.4 petabytes. Now that petabyte number is not really crazy amazing until you consider that we're just running in the hypervisor. Right? There's no storage subsystem involved. This is just hypervisors you're running on local disks. And these are just regular old disks, by the way. Right? So I, I was not part of the team that built this thing, um, but I have to say I'm very impressed with their work. Um, there's two ways to build these things out. So some customers come to us and they say, look, Alex, we really want something simple, right? I just want a SKU. I want a part to order on the internet. Fine, no problem. It's called vSAN ready. So you go in, it's a pre-configured node. It's got everything in it. Buy it from your favorite vendor, plug it into the rack, turn it on, wire it up, you're good to go. Some people are like, no, 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 no. I want that disk. I want that controller. I want that motherboard. Fine, no problem. As long as it's on the vSphere compatibility list, then it is vSAN supported, full stop. The only component of this system that's vSAN specific is the storage controller itself. And the reason for that is we need to be able to see the disks. So if you have a storage controller that's doing caching or is abstracting disks into LUNs and things like that, vSAN is not going to work with that. Right? So you want to have direct access to the disks. So there is a list of storage controllers that we support in vSAN. But every other component of the system is just standard old ESXi. Okay. And the way you, you fine tune this thing is by changing the number of SSDs in a unit, by changing their capacity, by changing the ratio of SSD to rotating media. And so you can have an incredibly fine tuned experience even within a single head unit. Right? So I can go with two SSDs per head unit or I can go with slightly larger SSDs per head unit. By default, we recommend about a 10% ratio. So if I have a terabyte of rotating media, then it's 100 gigabytes of, of SSD. But that's just a guideline. It depends on your actual workload. That's going to vary. Yes, sir? I thought you could only put one SSD in uh, each data store. Uh, the question is, I thought you could only put one SSD in a data store. That's not actually correct. It's one SSD per disk group. And you can have as many disk groups in a data store as you'd like. And more disk groups means more throughput. And, and you are required to have an SSD in every disk group? By definition, a disk group is an SSD. We create a disk group. Basically, what we mean by a disk group is an SSD with its backing rotating media. So if you just leave us in completely automatic mode, which is the default, we'll take every SSD that you have, make a new disk group for each one, and then keep adding rotating media until we run out. 
The question is, if I don't have any SSDs, then what? The answer is, vSAN requires SSD. You must have at least one SSD in every participating member of the cluster, right? Notice I said participating member of the cluster. Not all members of the cluster must participate. That's not required. In the vSAN infrastructure. And minimum of three physical hosts. Minimum of three, maximum 32. Okay? So really, we're just talking about an ESX feature, and this is a screenshot off the production product, right? You can see that just along with all the other features, DRS, sure, HA, sure, vSAN, yes. Now notice that down here it's grayed out, but the default is automatic mode, right? If you leave it in automatic mode, we will self-select the disks and we'll do everything for you. You can turn that off. You can manually configure it if you want to. But by default, you're done. One checkbox, you're done. There is one extra little step that I didn't mention, and that is to say that the, that the, um, the hosts must be able to see each other over an IP network, and we recommend that to be a, ten, uh, to be a gigabit network, right? But assuming that you have a fully connected uh, cluster that has high-speed interconnects, right, it'll just work. Okay. So when we, we talked about disk groups. So disk groups, oops. Disk groups are by definition an SSD and they're associating rotating media. And the reason why we do this is because the way vSAN works is that when you write a block, what we actually do is we write it to SSD. Always, exclusively. We never, ever, ever, ever write to rotating media. We always write to SSD. Sometime later, asynchronously, we will destage that write from SSD to rotating media. And this is the fun part, based on policy designators. So some virtual disks may never get destaged. That's perfectly fine. Some disks may be destaged right away. So now when I read a block, if I haven't been destaged, I go right from flash again, right? Because I'm already in flash. If I have been destaged, then I have to go hit the rotating media. Then when it comes back, it's cached up on the SSD tier again. And if I hit it again, I'm, I'm back in cache, right? So we're inherently using the flash as a read-write cache all the time. The way we use it, though, varies depending on the class of the object that we're talking about. Okay? We can take objects, big objects, like VMDK, virtual disk, we can split them into their, in their component pieces. We call those stripes. And then we can spread those stripes amongst the cluster. And why do we do that? Well, we do that for availability and performance, right? When you set a rule, say you say, this virtual disk is n plus one. What that means is that media must be written to at least two physical nodes before the write is committed to the guest. So we will write it in parallel to two physical nodes. When those writes commit, then and only then the guest receives a write commit. When you read, it'll read, it'll try to read from the local node first. If you're striped, it'll, it'll grab the local stripe. But if it's not, it'll go across the network, grab the stripe remotely, and then go forward. Right? So the guest perceives this, this common storage pool across the entire uh, cluster. What's actually happening, though, is we're taking the object, we're striping it up, and we're pushing it down across the cluster based on the rule set. What's interesting about this is that we can scale up in a single node or we can scale out by adding additional nodes. So as we build up, we can just keep adding hard drives or keep adding virtual disks and continue to scale up, or we can just scale out by adding additional nodes on demand. Not all nodes need to be the same size, right? You're gonna get the most consistent performance if your nodes are similar, but there is no requirement that they're the same. So you could have 10 terabytes on node one and one terabyte on node two, perfectly fine. You could have three SSDs in node one and one SSD in node two. That's fine. Operationally, you probably want them to be similar because that way all the VMs will be, receive similar performance as they get moved around the cluster, but that's not a requirement. And they don't need to be from the same manufacturer. You can have a mix of you know, HP and Dell or you can have racks and, uh, and blades. Doesn't matter, okay? And what that gives us is it gives us a very linear um, scalability factor. We are scaling linearly based on the number of nodes. So whatever that node's performance is, you take that times the number of nodes you have. So if you have eight nodes, and then you add an additional eight, you're basically doubling your performance. 
It's a very linear curve as the cluster size increases. From a storage perspective, that's exactly what you want, right? That's, it turns out the dirty secret of storage is if you have twice as much gear, you don't always get twice as much performance. But in our case, we do because of the way we're architected. Okay? That's a lot of stuff. Any questions? How about if we take a look at it actually working? How about that? Nobody wants to see it working? So I am not as brave as Dan. So I brought a recording. <laughs> so what's going to happen is, uh, let's say we have a vSAN cluster. What, what you actually see is you actually see a data, oh, I can't stand there. What you actually see is a data store. And when the cluster is enabled, you just see it as one of the, 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 many, the many data stores that are attached. Um, the, um, normally when you set this up, you'll build out your physical cluster, right? You'll add every node, and then you'll go in and you'll create storage policies. And storage policies are going to be whatever classes of storage internally you want to support, right? So for a lot of my customers, there's only one class of storage, you know, gold, <laughs> for lack of a better term. But you may have a situation where some of your VMs are more equal than others. And you want to, may want to promise them a higher level of IOPS. Or you may want to have more redundancy. And the way you do that is through storage policies. right? And storage policies can be whatever you want. And they're configured by the administrator. Um, the, uh, and this is just showing you what we've got here. right? So we've got the very simple vCN implementation. right? It's got three physical hosts. Um, so the next thing is we need to create our, um, our Cinder uh, uh, volume types. Um, and because we're, we're uh, real um, hairy developer types, we're going to use the command line instead of the wimpy UI way. Um, but obviously this works either way. Actually, you can tell that this was done by my engineer because it's all command line all the time. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the, um, uh, at the stack. We're going to create a goal. Um, and then uh, the next step is to add the extra specs that allows us to connect this to the, to the SPBM policy that we saw on the previous screen, right? So remember what we said is extra specs is just a delivery vehicle. And you can see that the VMware extra spec is called storage profile. And then it passes on the string called go profile. So if you recall from the previous screen, remember it was called go profile. So that's what connects it to. It's a very simple mechanism. It's just a literal string that we're passing. As long as those two match, everything's golden, right? So now we've kind of gone forward in the video a little bit here, and we've created a couple um, of different classes. So now that that's set up, though, you, you know, you're really probably only going to do that once, right? Um, the actual consumer experience is much simpler, right? The consumer experience is you go to the website or you go to the command line, you request a storage object, and you just say what kind you want, and then we give it to you, right? Very, very simple user experience. Again, the implementation detail underneath is completely hidden from the user. Um, I'm not going to go all the way through this because I'm assuming you guys all know how Cinder works. Right? So from this point forward, we're basically talking about normal, regular Cinderisms. Right? It appears as a volume type. You consume the volume type. Right? Nothing really amazing or special. On the back end, what happens is we translate that Cinder request into a, a storage policy management request. We pass that down to vSAN. We create the object. So I'm going to just go ahead and pause here. And this video is up on, on YouTube, so you can take a look at it. Also, it's in the lab. If you want to go out and build a vSAN lab, you can do that. It's pretty straightforward. OK? And in the interest of time, I'm just going to. OK. All right, so in summary. <laughs> so what we're seeing from OpenStack customers, what, what customers are telling us, is that um, you know, we really need low-cost, high-performance storage here. We don't need high-end replication solutions. We don't need synchronous replication. We don't need offline snapshots. We don't, we don't need all these fancy things. We need something that's performant, it's stable, and it's low-cost and runs on commodity hardware. Surprise, that's exactly what vSAN is. It's all of those things. Um, it's very simple to deploy and operate. Um, and from our perspective, the best part is it's integrated with vSphere. It's a vSphere feature. It's not a separate thing. Um, so from our perspective, this makes a lot of sense. right? We have a huge commitment to OpenStack within VMware. We have this storage product that seems to fit these, these use cases. 
And when we talk to customers about this, what they tell us is, yeah, this makes a lot of sense, right? So we're seeing a lot of people take this up. Does this mean that we expect all of our um, uh, these uh, OpenStack customers to go directly, directly to vSAN? Probably not, right? The vast majority of, of vSphere customers today are running on SANs. And most of them are really happy with those SANs. That's great. We love SANs. SANs are fantastic for what they do. So if you are implementing OpenStack in your production environment and you want to carve off a piece of your existing SAN and put that on OpenStack, it'll work just great. Everything that I just talked about will work perfectly well against the SAN infrastructure. Fiber Channel, iSCSI, NFS, it'll still work. This is just another option to, to look at, okay? So with that, I think I am right up against my time, and I thank you all very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, well, what happens if I'm running a VM on a cluster that's not a vSAN cluster? Can I consume vSAN storage? No. But if I'm on the same right. gig. If I'm on the same network, if I'm sitting, if I really have a great personality and I'm sitting really close, and no. Um, so vSAN is only managing storage within a single ESX cluster, only, exclusively. We are, despite the name, we're not actually a SAN. We don't support NFS, we don't support iSCSI, we don't... We don't support external SAN protocols, right? So if you want a centralized storage entity serving multiple clusters, there's some really great products out there that do that. That's not what vSAN does. What if it's a host in that cluster? Question, what if it's a host in that cluster? If you're hosting the cluster, then you can consume that storage whether you have local storage or not. Okay. It's a cluster level asset that can be accessed evenly by all the members of the cluster, but only the members of the cluster, not across clusters. But we can have a non-uniform cluster configuration, that works fine. Now there are performance implications to non-uniform clusters. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Will it work? Can you consume the storage of a foreign machine? Absolutely, right? So, so I don't have to have SSD in a host that's, if it's in the same cluster as some other hosts that do have SSD. Right, question is that means I don't have to have SSDs in every single host, correct. Keeping in mind the store, they, you could have performance implications by having non-uniform access. Right? Some VMs may experience higher performance than others. The other thing is, if you have members of the clusters who are not partici participating, it will limit the total number of VMs that you can support on a single cluster. And the reason is because we distribute the metadata across all members that are vSAN enabled. And the metadata limit is a per ESX limit. Right? So we can support 4,000 objects per ESX server, but that 4,000 objects is only distributed to participating members. So if you have a 16 node cluster with eight vSAN nodes, you're gonna get half the scalability as a 16 node cluster that are all vSAN nodes in terms of just number of objects that we can support. So there's some subtlety there, right? If you read the, the vSAN deployment guide, we strongly suggest that all, all members of the clusters participate, right? Because it's, it's more predictable that way and it's the safest option. Even if it's only just two disks in the, in the host. So, so you may have a case where you have Eight, 16 members of a cluster, eight of which have two disks, eight of which have 10 disks. That is totally fine, right? So the you know, classic thing is I have blades and I have rack mounts and I want the blades to participate. And the answer we would say is that's fine, but you probably want to go ahead and take the two spindles that are available in, this, in the blade, have them participate even though there's relatively small amount of storage. And the reason is because that way they can participate in the process. They can be a witness, they can store metadata, um, they can form quorums, right? So our, the design assumption is, is that most of them will. But the reason why it has to work when that's not the case is what happens if, if I have one SSD and a host and the SSD fails, right? You don't want to have it just fail, fall down and die at that point. So we have to support this mode where not all members are participating. So since that already has to work, right, you can do it by design as long as you are willing to accept the performance window that you're limiting there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, is Cinder doing the scheduling, or is the vSAN driver doing the scheduling? Can you pick and Yeah, so you can do it. So the question is, who's doing the scheduling? And the answer is, you can do either. You can specify a data store, and then basically Cinder is doing the scheduling. But we would prefer 
that you just tell us what kind of object you want and let us do it. Because we know much more about what's going on in the data stores um, than Cinder does. But you know, some people want to have more control, so we have to allow both ways. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we can have like a, this is what we refer to as a three beers conversation about who should be doing scheduling, right? It's more of a philosophical debate. Mechanically, we have some advantages because we're closer to the disks, right? There's also policy handoff. When we talk to the arrays, we give them policy hints, which Cinder can't do. So if you're not using our policy infrastructure, you don't receive the advantage of the policy hints. So your performance will drop. So that's the other reason to use our policy infrastructure. Other questions? Yes, sir. So you use by design, you are uh, using SSD for uh, you know, storing only the cache? Or no, it's a persistence tier. The question is what goes into that tier. So it would be more accurate, to, and if you're a storage guy, think of it as dynamic auto tiering at a block granular level. Or sorry, that was inaccurate. At a stripe granular level, right? Are you a storage guy? Oh, OK. In the storage world, those things mean things. So you say auto tiering to a storage guy as your eyes light up. Oh, you're doing auto tiering. So um, what happens is, is that if a stripe lands on an SSD, we consider that to be a write commit. If it was only a cache layer, that's not technically a commit. That's a dirty buffer. For us, that's a commit. So we consider that to be a valid commit, and we report that to the guest. Later, we may move it, right? So the, the storage, the big S storage world, like the pointy haired storage guys, that's not caching to them. That's auto tiering. So I think to a normal human, that's the same thing, right? But we have to use our words carefully because in the storage world, that means something. Right, but before you do the actual commit, right, uh, you know, it's not really you are moving the actual data at that point of time. In, in the, uh, There's actually two factors. One is how often you're accessing it, but the other one is the policy that you've set for the object. So some objects may have higher priority than others, causing them to be, um, we, 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 we call it the elevator mechanism. So you take the elevator down. <laughs> so you may, um, you may, or destaged. So you may get destaged. Um, so let's say you have VM1 and VM2. VM1 is set to 100% flash. VM2 is set to 0% flash. They both commit a write at exactly the same time. Both of those writes commit to SSD. The guest receives exactly the same acknowledgement at exactly the same time. One millisecond later, VM2's write gets destaged. VM1's write is not destaged. Then they read the same block. He gets a really fast access. He gets a slow one. Yeah. So is that caching or is that auto tiering? Fine, close enough, yeah. So I, I think what I'm saying, for all practical purposes, the distinction between those things is not that big. Mechanically, it's, it's the, what's happening is different. But the, the experience of the user, the experience of the VM is, is identical. We're using flash for IOPS. We're using rotating media for capacity, right? So you have, uh, you have policies, uh, SP, SPBM. SPBM. You're talking about my baby here, man, you know. Storage policy based management, yep. Um, so, in that, you can set the policies for how long you can have the cache on. Yeah, the, it's actually the policy is not how long, it's percentage of object size guaranteed. So, it's a reservation guarantee, but mechanically, it's basically the same thing. The bigger your guarantee, the more likely your write will remain longer. Yeah, so it's expressed as percentage of object size. One SSD and one rotating one medium. At a, at a minimum, yes. Is that, is that mandatory? I mean, if yes. I have just the SSDs and no, no uh, rotating media. Well, you can lie to us and tell us that the SSD is rotating media. We wouldn't know. But yes, we, we require, can, you will not enable a disk group unless you have at least one of each. So why, it won't work. Why do you make that mandatory? So the question is, why that crazy requ requirement, Alex? This doesn't make any sense to me. 
The reason why is because architecturally, we wanted to make sure that we had a uniform D-stage layer, which gives you a more even performance experience. The problem is, is if you have SSD without rotating media, you have no D-stage, right? So now architecturally, we can't assume that you can take the D-stage down to the rotating. So architecturally, we're assuming that we have two classes of disks, fast disks and slow disks, right? If you take the slow disk away, right, now we're just, we're just an all-flash array, right? Those things already exist, right? It's called Pure or Violin or, so we're just not in that business. If you want the world's fastest storage with ultra low latency and a million IOPS, buy a violin. They're really good at that. Yeah, that's what bothers me. You know, you yeah. said, uh, you know, I think one of the slides that uh, it just, uh, you know, an open stack workloads, you know. Uh, so that means you are limiting to very specific set of workloads. Mm. I don't think I said that. I think I said that it happens that vSAN is very well attuned to open source, open stack workloads. Uh, vSAN is not an, an open stack only product. It's a generic storage, it's a generic storage um, product. And the reason why we use both SSD and HDD is because in our research, what we found out is, is that the cost, the cost of ownership, the cost per IOPS on SSD is very low, but the cost per gigabyte is extremely high. HDD, the opposite. The cost per IOPS is high, the cost per capacity is low. So by combining the two, you get low cost per IOP, low cost per gigabyte on the same platform. So it's an architectural decision we've made. You guys will tell us whether it's right or wrong, right? Because if it's wrong, you won't buy it. Um, but we're pretty confident in this design. And if you look at what's going on in general in the storage industry, right? A lot of people are moving to this, this hybrid SSD HDD model. There are definitely use cases like high frequency trading, right, NASDAQ, where you want the absolute minimum possible latency with millions of IOPS. We're not that. We're a general purpose storage system for 80% of your workloads. Those storage systems are designed for 5% of your workloads and they're really, really, really good at that. And we didn't think that we could be a better high performance, low latency array than Violin or Pure or the others, right? On the other hand, we thought that we could produce a system that was, had a much better ROI for 80% of your workloads, and that's the system that we designed. You can definitely argue we made a mistake, but that, that's, that's the rationale. Yeah, I think we had a question back here. I think I'm gonna have to cut this out. They're gonna kick us out. I love this conversation, by the way. The, the, the next step is you're gonna have to buy me beers to continue asking questions, which is totally legal. Bribing your presenter with beers, totally cool at OpenStack Summit. One more question, and then I think they're going to kick us out of here, but I'm happy to continue the conversation. Yes, sir. Does vSAN have distance replication? The question is, does vSAN have distance replication? Um, vSAN does not, but vSphere does. So vSphere has replication if you want to use it. vSAN does not have its own replication if engine. I'm using vSAN, I can use it with SRM? Absolutely, using, uh, 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 using vSphere replication service. Keeping in mind that vSphere replication service has a minimum RPO of 15 minutes. So if that's what you're looking for, then then that would be an appropriate way to do it. Okay, I'm going to have to stop the questions here. I love the questions. Happy to talk to you outside, but they're going to kick us out of the room because it's after 6 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Thank you.